Last week, we started looking at the book of Leviticus, and uh, we looked at specifically verse 1, where it starts off with God speaking to Moses. And today, we're just going to kind of pick up right where we left off. Um, we looked at the idea of uh, how we are God's temple, how we turn to Jesus and trust, to Je and trust in Jesus. And as we do that, the Holy Spirit purifies us so that God can dwell with us. Um, and we looked at the way that once we turn to Jesus, once we accept Jesus, then our sacrifices are accepted. Uh, our, our good deeds are accept acceptable to God before uh, we come to Jesus. No matter what we do, um, it, it, we can't be accepted by God because we are not pure before God. But after he does the work, we, we accept Jesus, and then he does the work in us, and, and now our good deeds they, they matter, they're acceptable to him. If you notice, uh, I didn't really bring this up last week, but if you notice, the tabernacle didn't have to get repurified. They didn't have to keep doing that over and over again. It was an event that happened at the end of, end of Exodus. And this is uh, the way that this applies to us is that we don't have to keep getting resaved every single time we mess up. Like, oh, I messed up again. I got to go to God again and get saved again. I got to go to the altar every single week. And, you know, you don't, you don't lose your salvation every single time that you mess up. Rather, we confess it to God. We don't have, uh, we don't have like, um, confession boosts or anything like that. We confess it to God, and then we trust in God's goodness. We don't trust in, in ourselves, because we have a tendency of doing something along the lines of this, okay? Uh, God, I messed up again. I'm so sorry. Please, I'll never do it again. Forgive me. And we try to make it this thing of, I'll, I'll earn it. I'll earn it next time. Uh, I mean, don't don't you feel like you've done that before in your life? I know I have, uh, but with, with 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 God we don't do that. But we trust that His goodness is enough that He's going to uh, cover our deficit. Now, in the book of Leviticus, there are five different um, five different sacrifices, and we're not going to look at all five because that'd be that'd be a long <laughs> that'd be a long uh, sermon. We're, we're not going to do that. But uh, we are going to actually start looking at the specifics of the first one, which is called the burnt offering or the burnt sacrifice. Um, it's, it, unfortunately, it, it's very common for Christians to look at the sacrifices of Leviticus or, 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 you know, the different laws of numbers or whatever, and to say something along the lines of this. Oh, Jesus. So they just kind of instantly dismiss it and overlook it and kind of gloss it because Jesus. But, but the problem with this is that not, not every sacrifice given was for the sake of sin. So when you go through and you just blow past it and don't really pay attention to what you're reading just because Jesus, you miss how books like Leviticus can really apply uh, to your life today. So let's start in verse 2. It says, Speak to the Israelites and tell them, when any of you brings an offering to the Lord from the livestock, you may bring your offering from the herd or the flock. Now, I know there's kind of this thing that I hear a lot as a pastor, and, and I know I've done it a lot too, where we say something along the lines of this. We, we mess up with the sin, with a certain sin over and over and over again. And so then we say something along, along the lines of this. Well, I've messed up too much. Uh, I don't feel I'm good enough. I, there, there's nothing I can do. Uh, you know, I, I, why, why even try? I just, I don't, just don't feel like I'm good enough. But if you notice in, in Leviticus 1, 2, our feelings are never really mentioned. It's not really an issue of, whether you feel acceptable to God, right? It's an issue of whether or not whether or not you're pure before God. And if you believe in Jesus, you are. See, it's about actions, not about not about the feelings that you're having. Um, I mean, you think of it like this. Well, oh, I don't really feel like worshiping today. That's when your worship is genuine. I don't really feel like praying today. That's when you really have to push yourself and make that decision. It's something that, that it doesn't come naturally. When you don't feel like trusting and you trust anyways, that is real trust. Uh, when you have reason not to, and you keep pushing into the heart of God, and, um, you know, like this one, when you don't feel like doing the right thing, when you don't feel like sacrificing for the Lord, and you do it anyways, that's that, that's something that, that, that's, that's, that, that's really where, God, where, where the law guides us to. It doesn't guide us to be led by feelings and to back off from, from the presence of God. Rather, since we have Jesus, we should press in closer um, to, the, to the holy place where God is, closer to his throne of mercy. So the burnt sacrifice itself is oftentimes voluntary. Not, not, not always. Uh, there's going to be a lot of times throughout Leviticus it says, for this offer burnt offering. But in Leviticus 1-2, we're talking about generally burnt offerings, which are 
generally speaking, voluntary. Now, the burnt offering is, is broken up into three different categories. In, in, ver in verse 3, it says the first category. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he is to bring an unblemished male. And we're going to break that down in just a minute. He will bring it to the entrance to the tent of, the, of meeting so that he may be accepted by the Lord. And then you get to uh, verse 10. But if his offering for a burnt offering is from the flock, from sheep or goats, he is to present an unblemished male. So that, that's the second category. And then you get to verse 14. If his offering to the Lord is a burnt offering of birds, he is to present his offering from the turtle doves or young pigeons. So there's, there's, we can kind of break this down into some kind of manageable, pe manageable pieces. <laughs> Excuse me, manageable pieces. Uh, first off, the males of the of the herd or flock they're less needed than the females and all the girls say mm-hmm but, but we're not talking about uh you know um we're not talking about like you know feminism or anything like that it's just the sake of animals I, i'm sure many of you have have raised animals before and i'm more familiar with chickens raising chickens but with chickens you really only need like one rooster per 12 hens it's just they're not as as needed uh, you know, it only takes one uh, boy chicken to do, you know, the business. But with, but with most animals, um, chickens are, aren't really one of those animals. But a lot of animals, uh, you know, it, it takes a while for the, for the female to produce, uh, you know, the, the offspring. And so you would only really need one uh, male per female. So in that way, uh, males are less needed than, than the females. Now, it's important to note that not every sacrifice was always male. Um, the burnt offerings, though, were always male. Now, now there, there, there might be an exception here, um, and that's with the birds. It is possible that the birds didn't have to be males. Um, both the cows and the sheep were specified, but the birds were not. Um, so the birds maybe. I think the reason for that is because sometimes it's hard to tell. Like um, the the two different the two different kinds of birds mentioned were the turtle doves or the young pigeons. Turtle doves are extremely difficult to tell male from female, except for in their um, in their mating time, which is just a short time out of the year. Y pigeons uh, are a little bit easier from from body size, but excuse me, uh, but it seems a little bit maybe um, not as clear as to whether the birds had to be males or not. Um, and then the second thing with the males, so not only were they less needed, but they were also more costly because of obviously mating genes. Uh, if you've got, let's say, a, a prize bull, um, you can mate him with the different cows and get stronger offspring. Now, I want to, if there's any kids listening, I want to make sure to get this absolutely clear. This is not true of people. Men are no less needed or more valuable uh, than women. That's that's not what I'm saying at all. Uh, this only really applies uh, to, to, to animals. So uh, as far as the different categories themselves, uh, the birds were more for poorer, poorer people. <laughs> And nowadays we kind of have this, have this idea of gouging the rich, right? But the law didn't really gouge the rich, and it didn't. But it did. It did make way for the poor. So uh, that's something just to kind of um, keep in mind there. Um, however, in each of these cases, these three categories—be it the the cow, the sheep, or the bird—in each case, the animal was domestic. It was not wild. Which brings us to the first point from Leviticus uh, that I want to make today. Uh, the sacrifice must cost something. And this is something that, that I've, I've talked about before um, in, in previous sermons. But for a sacrifice to really mean anything, it really has to cost something. Uh, but in, in our lives, though, we genu generally try to do things without cost. So, like, I'll serve God, but without a cost. I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to actually have to change my lifestyle. I just want to, um, you know, um, be all good with God. I want to be in ministry, but I want to be in ministry without cost, where I'm comfortable and it doesn't. I don't have to sacrifice myself and and be in uncomfortable situations. I want to be married, but I want to be married without cost, uh, where I can put myself first. And you know, my wife just has, or my husband uh, has to just kind of work around me. And you know, uh, that's just tough on them. You know, if they really love me, they'll, they'll work. Around. It's all their fault. And that's just silly. It's just silly. Uh, I'll go to church so long as I agree with everything that's happening. I'll serve so long as people appreciate me. I mean, I know for myself, when I got married, I thought, oh, I love you, I love you, right? And my wife, oh, I love you. But then after we'd been married, things started happening. You know, you got health problems, uh, the death of children. You start waking, waking up with the same person every day. Uh, you know, sometimes maybe you're a little bit caught off guard with the whole no makeup situation. <laughs> uh, and you wake up to their irritating quirks every day. And 
for for you to actually um, stay faithful and, and serve them through that, that's when love starts to really get um, get depth to it. It's easy to say I love you, but it's a lot harder. You know, it's easier to say I do, but it's a lot harder to stick with it. Um, or you know, hey, I want kids, but kids are a lot of work, and and they don't do what you want. Kids grow up and have their own their own thoughts, and they make their own life choices. Um, you know, they choose their own spouses and all these different things, and it it's a lot different than you have in your head. Whether you realize it or not, you, you, you're going to think, oh no, hey, my kids, um, I'm going to have a lot more influence with them than, than them. I mean, think of how people say this. My kids would never do that. Oh, wouldn't they though? Uh, I was at a church one time where there was a board member who, who he had a great show of, uh, of sacrifice for the church. Everybody thought, oh man, look at him. He's doing so much uh, for the betterment of the church. And... Uh, you know, oh wow, so great. But the entire time he was profiting financially and it was very illegal things that were happening. Very illegal things. But everybody had this idea that he was, you know, this great knight for the church. And see, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Sacrifices have to cost something. Maybe maybe your, uh, maybe your fame, maybe your, your, your title. Now, it was Israel's choice whether or not to offer sacrifice. But once they had decided, there were rules. There are standards for sacrifices. Uh, it wasn't something that they could just, okay, well, now that I have decided to offer a sacrifice, God is just so lucky to have that, that he just has to put up with whatever nonsense I give him. No, 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 no. It was Israel's choice to offer or not to offer a sacrifice, but once they decided, there were definitely rules. Uh, one of the things it says is that the sacrifice had to be unblemished. So it had to be domestic, it had to be male, it also had to be unblemished. Oh, I'll volunteer, but don't correct me. You're lucky I'm doing this at all. Uh, I'll give money to the church, but I I get to, I get a say so of, of how I how I want it spent. I control things. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll be here for for my spouse, but only if they're here for me. If they start being emotionally distant, hey, that's okay. If I start you know getting close with other people, if they if they stop you know uh, being intimate with me, that's okay. That I go and look at things that I shouldn't be looking at. Uh, which brings me to the second point I want to make from Leviticus: We bring inferior efforts. And yet we want superior praise. We bring an inferior effort and want a superior praise. So in our marriage, you know, my marriage, I don't want to have any sacrifice. I don't want to have to change. I don't want to have to admit that I might be wrong and and have to grow. Oh, no, I I, I want it to always be my spouse's fault. I I want to be married, but I don't really want to contribute. You know, I'm I'm tired of when I go home from work. I don't want to change diapers. I don't want to mess with that. Uh, I'm not good at fill in the blank, singing, cooking, cleaning, uh, children's ministry, whatever. And I will not get any better. And then if I'm replaced, I'm going to be offended. And I have this this saying. I got it from Sam Chand, a uh, uh, leadership uh, coach that uh, that I took a took a course through. Uh, and it's this really good concept. If you won't grow, you got to go. And I hold that. I hold my, I hold myself to that. If there comes a time where I'm, I'm stopped growing as a pastor, where I'm not, I don't want to. I'm not moving the church forward anymore. I gotta go. It's time to get somebody else in there that's got a new vision that, that wants to move the church forward. I can't hold the entire church captive, you know, by my lack of drive. And it's the exact same thing when you volunteer for something. You know, oh, you're so li- no, 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 no. You are offering a sacrifice to God. It has to be something that's you have to give actually an unblemished sacrifice. Do a good job. You know, good. Do if you're gonna volunteer for something, learn how to do it better. You don't have to be perfect, but for goodness sakes, learn how to do it better. You know, what if people, whoever they wanted, could go on the worship team and, you know, they just were terrible at singing? No, do we all have to have to step around that, that, that horrible singing? No, no. Learn to do better or do something else that you can do well. Um, and the issue isn't trying. The issue is not trying. The issue is refusal to change. When you bring a blemished a, a, a blemish sacrifice. This is what that looks like. You are refusing to change. You're refusing to learn. You're refusing to do better. You're refusing to grow. I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do it with griping and nitpicking and fighting and gossiping. Sacrifices cannot be sickly or malformed. Well, look what I did, God, and the whole time God's saying, but look how you did it. Look how you did it. Now, If you notice, uh, it says very specifically that the sacrifice had to be 
it had to be offered at the tabernacle. And the reason being because that was God, that was where God was. It wouldn't be accepted otherwise. Uh, God was in their midst, so they had to bring the sacrifices there to him. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he is to bring an unblemished male. He will bring it to the entrance to the tent of meeting so that he may be accepted by the Lord. Now, if you notice, there's three different places where the sacrifices were, were happening. And we're going to get this get to this in just a minute. So the, the bull was offered on the west side of the altar before the entrance to the tent of meeting. The sheep or goat was offered on the north side um, to the left of uh, the entrance to the tent of meeting. And the bird was sacrificed on the right side or I'm sorry, not the right side, the east side, so the the, the, uh, the opposite side of the altar. Now, this seems to be nothing more than um, nothing more than, than placement so that, you know, different sacrifices could be done at different times, but um, there might be more to that um, that I'm, I'm missing. Uh, so, so the sacrifice had to be made at the tabernacle because God was there. Uh, it says that here in verse 3, um, and if you notice, uh, there's a lot of times we have this idea when we give sacrifices to God. And I'm not talking about animal sacrifices. I'm talking about when we sacrifice of ourselves, or our time or our money or whatever to God. Um, and that's where we offer and we offer and we're just, no matter how much we do, it's not good enough. We're, we're rejected by people and we don't feel like it's Here's the thing. When you offer a sacrifice trying to impress people, you're going to keep on working and never, ever get accepted for it. But if you look in verse 3, when you bring your effort to God, it's good enough. Bring an unblemished male. He will bring it to the entrance to the tent of meeting so that he may be accepted by the Lord. See, when you bring it to God, it's good enough. When you bring it trying to impress people, it'll never be good enough. So now let's look at, uh, look at uh, another aspect here. It says in verse, nine, in verse 9, the offerer is to wash its entrails and legs with water. And we're going to come back to that uh, I mean, in, in the future. But for right now... Today, we're just starting with the beginning of that verse. And beginning of 13, but he is to wash the entrails and legs with water. Very similar, basically the same thing. Uh, verse 16, he will remove its digestive tract, cutting off the tail feathers and throw it on the east side of the altar at the place for ashes. So, um, the, the, just a few points to make. First off, uh, it says east. Why does it say on the east side? Because that's the farthest away from the tabernacle. So you're taking the... Um, the the, the, the different uh, the different parts and removing them as far away from God as, as, as the presence of God as possible. So let's let's kind of break this down a little more. Uh, if you have an older translation, uh, it might read something along the lines of uh, removing the bird's crop. Uh, that's not overly accurate. It's more of talking about the digestive area, and so we're talking about everything from from you know the bum upwards. Uh, and the idea here is uh, that no fecal matter is on the altar. If you ever butchered animals, you know that sometimes they make a bit of a mess, or you know even if they didn't make a mess, which is a miracle in and of in and of itself, uh, when they're using the restroom while they're you know living their animal life, uh, a lot of times get splatter on them. So the idea here is cleaning off the animal to make sure. So there's no fecal matter present. Uh, you're cleaning out the legs where it would splatter, you know, that whole area, removing the digestion area there. And, and the whole idea that this is trying to make is nothing unclean can be on the holy, which brings us kind of to the third point here. God is holy, and since he is holy, we cannot mix the unclean with the clean, the holy with the profane. You can't do that. So four specific examples of this. Marriage is holy. Uh, the state kind of thinks that they that they, you know, Invented marriage, they didn't. God did from the very beginning. God, God gave us marriage. And marriage as such is holy. It cannot be defiled. And so some of the things that, uh, that marriage is and, and, and that relationship is defiled with, um, you know, sleeping around and stuff, not, not a good idea. Just for the sake of, you know, um, Paul talks about this. When you sleep with someone, you are, um, you are becoming one with them. And that's not how God didn't intend for that to be a casual thing. He intended for it to be kept holy. Um, intimacy in itself is a holy thing, okay? Um, and it really can't be defiled. And so a couple of things that people um, people do defile it with. Um, animals. Uh, this is this is unacceptable. Uh, children, you know, between adults and children, that's unacceptable. Having extra or, or open marriages and that kind of nonsense, that's, that's not keeping it holy. Uh, and then the last one that I want to want to mention is something that gets a lot of attention nowadays, but it's one in many. Um, marriage mixed with the same sex. The, this is not something that is keeping it holy. God designed it at the beginning. He said, for one man with one woman, not, not for one 
man with one child, one woman with one, one child. Now with a man with a, a, an animal, it wasn't about love. It wasn't about um, what's, you know, what the feeling is. It was about uh, an oath before God, a gift that God gave to, to mankind to keep it holy. Now, obviously we can't delve too much into this, but it will be something we have to come back to in the book of Leviticus. But the main idea here is marriage is holy. It cannot be uh, mixed with the profane. The second example, you can't say that you worship, you can't worship Jesus, say you love Jesus, and be involved in the occult. Uh, and you actually see Christians do this a lot. I love Jesus, but I'm involved in astrology. I'm going to, you know, get, you know, uh, read the stars and all this stuff. I love Jesus, but I'm going to have a Ouija board. Uh, I love Jesus, but I'm going to have healing crystals and have my palms read and, and, and go to seances. These kinds of things, that you cannot mix the holy with the profane. But if, if God really loves us, he'll accept us as we are. Yes, he does accept us as we are, but he doesn't keep us where we are. And just because God, God loves us doesn't mean he's okay with us living however we want. The third example, we can't say that we love God and yet hate sinners. Are you winning an argument or are you winning a soul? And you're going to have a lot of a lot of opportunities to win arguments. They're going to say something, oh, yeah, this is great. You're going to go on Facebook or YouTube or you're going to, you know, somebody's going to say something in front of you. You're going to have lots of opportunities. But you can either win the argument or you can win the soul. And we as Christians are here to win souls. Uh, nowadays, sinners equate their sin as their identity. They equate their sin as their identity. So anytime you say something, it's going to be um, a little bit hard. Uh, a lot of times it's easier to say things to friends. Uh, but the reason that they think you hate them isn't just your words, though. It's also, in, in a large degree, your attitude. See, telling them the truth, saying, speaking the truth, saying it like it is, that's not always the same thing. Proverbs warns us to make wisdom palatable to make it appeasing uh when when you're when you're talking to somebody you don't have to say it in the most offensive way possible which is something we really like to do you know uh well this is just the way it is and they they should they should they should hear the truth yeah but, i mean think about in first corinthians where paul talks and he says look even if i speak in the tongues of angels and i know all mysteries but i don't have love it's nothing but a noise I mean, surely this this applies not just to prophecy, but also to the way that we're that we're witnessing to people. So, in the fourth example, uh, you can't say you're Christian and yet live life on your own terms. I'm going to be given to fits of anger, and you just have to step around it. No, no, you have to grow and mature. I'm going to look at online content, and that's just it's not really hurting anybody. Well, first off, it is hurting people, but second off, no, no, we as Christians cannot mix the holy with the profane. And when you come before God and you offer a sacrifice with self-righteousness, you are polluting the clean. And I see people, Christians do this a lot, actually. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this sin, but I'm going to condemn them for their sin. So it's okay that I'm looking at online content that I shouldn't, but I'm going to tell homosexuals about how they're going to hell. I'm going to make sure that, uh, you know, I can, I can uh, be looking at other people that I'm not married to. <laughs> it's okay that I, um, you know, that I do these things that I shouldn't be doing. But hey, it, God's okay with it because that's my sin. But then when it comes to homosexuals, I need to make sure that they know that they're sinning. Well, no, that's self-righteousness. And when you come to God with self-righteousness, look at, look at my goodness. Look at how great I am. Well, first off, God can't accept that. It's, it's a blemished sacrifice. And second off, you're turning other people away from God. And the problem is, is you're not... You're not telling it like it is. You're giving them a partial Jesus. And the reason why you're giving him, them a partial Jesus is because that Jesus is okay with your sin, but he's not okay with theirs. And I've found that the more we struggle in life, the more we heap abuse on others. The more we heap abuse on others. When, when you genuinely encounter God's grace in your life, you give grace. Sometimes I forget, uh, sometimes I think that, that we forget that, that we are bad. We get saved and we just kind of forget something along the lines. Um, it, a, in our culture, this, this is kind of something that's a little bit, a little bit of, an, of, a, of a trigger. So let me just kind of break it down. Um, we are only not bad when we compare ourselves to other people. But if we compare ourselves with the holy and perfect God, then we're all pretty bad. You know, we do good things on occasion 
Maybe we even make it our life purpose to do, to do, to do good things. But that doesn't make us not bad. What makes us not bad is when God, we, we, we find our forgiveness and our healing in God. So we as people are bad. This is part of the gospel. But that's not the whole part. The, the rest of the gospel is that Jesus is our intercessor and his goodness is handed over to us so that we are accepted before God. Sometimes, though, I think that we forget that we're bad. We hold ourselves on this, like, lofty position where, oh, I, I, I am such a good person. We get saved and we just kind of, we forget that we are just as dependent on God's grace now as we were back then. Every day we're saved, we don't earn it more. We're, we're bad. We're standing, on, we're trusting on Jesus and he, his goodness is enough. We don't have to keep trying to earn ourselves. See, but what we do is we like to compare ourselves with ourselves. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty good person because of how we view other people. I mean, even Mother Teresa, who is held as, you know, one of the, you know, uh, great examples of the last generation, even she thought she wasn't good enough. So how good is good enough? And the thing I want you to get here, okay, from, from, from your struggling is everybody struggles, and that's fine. Right? Uh, I, I know I've made a lot of mistakes as a pastor. I'm going to make more. That's fine. Making mistakes is not, the, that's not the issue here. Everybody struggles. But don't make peace with the enemy that you can't beat. And maybe you find yourself today where you're trying to follow Jesus. But you just, you just have a bad attitude. You just, you just feel it. Inside, you just feel it. You, you mean, you're really easy to get upset. Uh, you get offended constantly that that that's a blemish sacrifice it's not so much what you do but how you do it see god is not as interested in making sure that you do all the right things as he is about your attitude oh but god don't you see that i'm pastoring for you uh yeah but what if you're pastoring with a bad attitude what if you're doing it grudgingly what if you're giving but grudgingly that's not not what we're called to or maybe you find yourself in a place where you're sacrifice. You're trying to sacrifice for God, but you're trying to do it to appease Him, to make Him happy, to 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 prove yourself. Okay, your your sacrifice. It. Let me let me say this differently. Your sacrifice is already accepted because of Jesus. You don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to constantly try to earn God paying attention to you. You don't have to do that. Or maybe you don't fit in either of those categories. Maybe you fit in this category where you heard what I had to say from Leviticus and you came to the conclusion, you know, I just don't, I just don't really see how this applies to me. And for that, the only real cure is to ask God, God, what is this pleasing in your eyes? So if you'll pray, pray with me for just a minute. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to us, first off, that you would show us what is displeasing in your eyes. Reveal to us what we are doing that is offensive to you, that is a blemish to you. But also, Lord, as we seek you, as we serve you, as we worship you, Lord, help us to do it with the right attitude. Lord, that we wouldn't be in a place of constantly being uh, offended or offendable. That we wouldn't be in this constant state of, of trying to irritate people, uh, giving... Uh, giving rise to gossip and dissension. Lord, and I pray that as we seek you today, we would come to you and just accept your grace. That we wouldn't struggle with trying to trying to earn it, but rather we just accept the fact that we're never going to earn it, and you've given it to us freely. Lord, help us to rest in that and to accept what Jesus has done. And we thank you, Lord. Amen.